So, I really don't like speaking at large groups, even though I've been doing it for almost 30 years since a classroom of 70 kids in a civil war in Liberia. The truth is, what I prefer is speaking with large groups, structuring some opportunities for us to think together, or in a word, participation. So I'd like to spend our 10 minutes together thinking about what could happen if more of us peeked into the windows of our school buildings, or better yet, if more of our students actually spent more time peeking out of them. Are you prepared for that? I'd like to use a technique as we talk about this issue called fist to five, so that you can participate with me as we talk. Basically, if I ask a question and you raise a fist in the air at me, I know you're not very comfortable. But if you give me a high five, that's great. We've got some agreement. Any number in between is OK also, a two, a four, just so long as it's not that one, OK? Let's keep it civil. So let's try. Are you prepared? Fist to five. Great. OK. If you'd rather participate than be spoken at, don't you think that's true for the students who sit in our classrooms day in and day out? Do children really need to be prepared to participate? How many of you know what it would take to prepare children for the mid-21st century? Fifth, the five? What do you think? How many of you know? And while you're asking yourself that question, did you stop to think that we're already two decades in to the 21st century? So that maybe the question ought to be, why are we trying to prepare kids for the only century every single one of them has ever known? And I think the answer to that question is because our generation is not terribly comfortable with the 21st century. And so we try to make it feel more and more like the 20th century that we knew. And we certainly do that in education. For the last 30 years, if not longer, teachers have been asked, or more often tasked, to design with an end in mind. And that's a very famous phrase in education. And what it means is that somebody comes up with some standards and asks teachers to teach them and then test them so that we know what students know and are able to do. Now, the decision to do that is from but a single perspective in our schools, that of the adults, although it might be better to say it's from the adults in our governments and corporate boardrooms. Standards are necessary in teaching, and I'm not advocating doing away with the standards. But they're really not why I teach, and they're really not what most of our students come into the building every morning to learn. Teaching and assessing those standards is a decision that comes from thinking about what adults should do in order to make sure adults are getting it right, not what kids should do. And it's really more of a management perspective than it is a perspective that's focused on the learners. So you might also call it a policy question. And I think, from years of doing this work, that education policy only gets really interesting if we focus on the learners and the what and the why questions that they have, rather than the how questions for adults. So I'm thinking you kind of like that opportunity. Am I right? Fist to five? You want to talk about what and why? OK, I'm seeing a lot of fives. Good. When we admit the what and the why, I think there are two perspectives that come up. And this is the first one, authenticity. Now, authenticity, I think, comes naturally from the people who want to hire our students. We want to know our kids understand the real world. But parents are increasingly asking for authenticity. And so are our students. Authenticity is basically what everyone wants in education, even those who wrote the standards. After all, those common core standards you hear about, well, they're written to prepare kids for college or career after school, so they must be pretty authentic, except that if we spend so much time teaching and testing them that students never get to use them after school or until after school. When we wait until after school for that, then we're missing the point why we adults adopted them in, in the first place, because we thought they would be relevant. And relevance is the second question I think we have to consider. And relevance is different from authenticity because it's not an end that teachers can hold in mind. Students in the room, am I right about that? Fist to five, what do you think? Can teachers know what's relevant to you? Relevance is something that is in students' minds. 
And if we're going to understand that, students need to participate in conversations with their teachers, sometimes in conversations with their community, like you see here, and sometimes even getting teachers in the community to talk to each other so that we know what's relevant for our students. Now, education like that is about more than subjects. It's about participation and empowerment. And I think that's really good because that's kind of why we created public schools in the first place. So that students could be prepared, not just for college and career, but for life in our society. And in our society, we take it as a given that there are certain fixed standards that we get to work with, but that we try to use those standards to do something that is relevant for everyone. I mean, this is America. You're with me on that, right? Fist to five. We don't mandate one answer that everybody is supposed to follow, right? Okay. So that's why I think that if we think about education in this way, we realize that the standards are not the end in mind, but a means to the end in mind. And that's important because students live in a new culture of learning. The phrase comes from Doug Thomas and John C. Lee Brown at Stanford. And this graphic comes from a workshop I did with teachers in North Carolina last year. Students are now surrounded by enormous learning opportunities that go far beyond school walls. And as a result, a lot of them are starting to check out at school. They may not do the work, or they may just do the work for a grade, and neither of those is a good decision when it comes to participating in our society. But I think what they're telling us as a generation is they're not very wild about the decisions that we're making about education in this society either. So I think we have to ask ourselves, what can we do to help this generation seize those opportunities that are around them right now in this new culture of learning? while learning about what previous generations did when they had their chance. And as an answer to that question, using schools to mandate a single answer for all kids through standards is not going to be able to work. It's just simply not complex enough. Holding an end in mind, posting it on a wall, and testing it 50 days a year is not going to work. And that's why I think the complexity is the third thing we really have to think about. Now, complexity is very different from rigor, a phrase that you also hear a lot about in schools. Rigor is how hard something is. Complexity is what results when students take something they're learning, try to apply it to a challenge, and then try to learn from that experience. And because it has those phases, it's much more dynamic and individualized. And that means that we're no longer going to be able to test for a single answer with what students do with those standards. We're going to have to look at what students do as a whole community and give them some advice about whether what they're contributing is good for society, or maybe some coaching. Some of the most amazing programs that I've had a chance to work with in the last 10 years are doing exactly this. They're doing away with tests, whether in pencil and paper or on computers, and they're replacing assessment with opportunities for kids to go out into their community and use their learning for credit. Do they sometimes make mistakes when they do that? Absolutely. How many of you have made a mistake at work in the last month? Fist to five, fist being none, five being yeah, okay? The really exciting thing about these kids is that they often do better in the world of work than we do as adults, precisely because they've not been prepared for it. It's a lot easier to think outside that box we always talk about when you weren't taught it was there in the first place. So I think we need to change our invitation to students when they come to school. We need to stop asking and testing whether they're prepared. And we need to start inviting them by saying, what would you like to do with the learning that we have to offer? And then we need to empower them to do it. This should be our end in mind, and this should be our policy. And the great thing is that no one in this room has to wait for a policymaker to mandate it. You could get involved tomorrow by working with a teacher to help them design an authentic and meaningful project, or by serving as a mentor to a child who can't quite figure out a way to make it in school, but might really be able to make it outside of that box in life. Would you like that opportunity, fist to five? Well, that's pretty good, because that's my idea worth spreading, and I would love to live in the world that I think we could build if we spread it together. <laughs>